Oh, okay. So I am doing this introduction for the podcast that I just finished recording, and I'm going to do this right now, but I want to tell you what it did for me. I think I was close to tears <laughs> during parts of this. You know, this is a friend of mine from Boulder where I first met her. And she's been on the podcast before because I like her, like like what she represents and who she is. And she's actually one of us, quote unquote, flipping 50. But she has another story that I didn't know about. And that's really what we're talking about today and the layers of it that we peel back. And I wanted to make sure that I record this introduction with that kind of emotion. And I really hope that you take the time. So this was a, this is a longer podcast than normal. And, um, there's a reason for it. I was in the middle of it and I was just like, I'm, we're going to tell this story. We're going to do it justice. And I also have a selfish reason for doing so. And that is that, um, as I'm releasing this, this is the last weekend to register for the September, uh, Flipping 50 retreat with me in Colorado. Vicki, who is the guest today, will be there and she will be doing both, telling a little more of her story behind the scenes and then leading us in a running clinic. Now stay with us. So if you don't think you're a runner, you never wanted to be a runner, <laughs> you're still going to benefit. So we're not making you run laps, you know, around Coot Lake or or anything close. We're going to watch your form. We're, I say we, Vicky's going to watch your form. And this is about improving your biomechanics and the way you run and carry yourself. So it feels more comfortable, whether you end up using this for just walking, walking faster, hiking, for doing Zumba, and we'll, we'll find what is your best movement. What will you do really well and how can you continue to improve? So the tease is this, but everybody will get to enjoy this podcast for obvious reasons. Her book, Running and Returning, it's yes, a book, it's a story. Most of all, it's a glimpse into the tapestry of life for now a 61-year-old runner, Vicki Hunter. Vicki is a prior fellow trainer that I met at Rally Sport in Boulder, Colorado, while I lived there. She has recently published a book, and whether you are a runner, like an ultra runner, and a fast one at that, like Vicki, or a parent of a child with addiction, or none of the above, this episode is one that you will identify with simply because you have your own tapestry of life. Vicki's story is testimony to the resilience of the body and of the mind. And as we talk about first, an accident that occurred for her 25 years ago, don't tune out. Don't go and think, well, this didn't happen when she's my age, so it doesn't matter because there's another accident coming. Okay. So spoiler alert there. I did, I blew it a little bit, but I felt like you need to know that before we dive in. So you have the full story and hang on. Cause I'm going to read her bio. Vicki Ash is a writer, runner, coach, and retired university instructor. A lifelong athlete, Hunter found respite in running as a teenager in the 1970s, and she's since relied on it to satisfy her competitive nature and keep her body and mind healthy and strong. Her running resume is stacked with races ranging from 5K to 50, that was 50 miles, including the 1988 Olympic Marathon Trials, and the Pikes Peak Marathon a dozen times. She still competes and in 2021, at age 60, ran the Boston Marathon in three hours and 30 minutes. Hunter's running career is dotted with accidents and injuries, however, and some of them were life-threatening and life-altering. Most significantly, she came back from near death after a car accident in 1997 when she was pregnant with her first child. She credits her own fitness and fortitude and her will to deliver a healthy baby. Running 
and the care of specialized and alternative practitioners for her and her daughter's survival, recovery, and return to real life. Hunter, who retired from the University of Colorado, where she taught political science, is now a running coach certified in foundation training and the Lydiard Method. She's a movement specialist who works with athletes of all levels and abilities and is particularly attuned to the needs of ultra runners. Influenced by her own experience recovering from injuries, she's passionate about and dedicated to helping people move better. Hunter holds a PhD in political science and is the mother of two grown daughters. She and her husband live in Boulder, Colorado and Kona, Hawaii. Nice life, right? Running and Returning is her book. It is her first book though. And I think that is a line you want to keep in mind. There are a lot of things coming up next. Let's dive into this episode right after this. I'm Deborah Atkinson. You're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top struggles and concerns, but most of all, like this episode, I hope to inspire you and maybe change your mind and raise the glass ceiling about what you think you can expect in the next decades of your life and the passion and purpose with which you live them. I share what to eat, how to move, and how to change your mindset. You're going to get a little bit of how to move and mindset mostly today so that you can have the energy and the vitality that you want, need, and deserve in this second and better half. And let's dive in. Vicki, thank you so much for being here. Deborah, it's my pleasure. And it's always fun to talk to you. So, And this is not, you know, I realize that it's been so long. This is not, though, your virgin episode. You, we have true. another one in the archives. I need to pull that out and I'll link to it so everybody gets to know you. And we had a great talk then, too. And I remember distinctly when we finished, I was like, we definitely need to have you back. Well, here you are, and I'm having you back, but not for the reason I would have suspected. So there's something new. And so I want to talk a little bit about your book, but really talk about what's in it, not in a way that we don't want every listener to get their hands on it because it's so inspirational. So um, the book, what I'd love to ask you first and foremost is what prompted you? to write it, to tell your story, which is also your daughter Jade's story. Well, first of all, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about my book because it's been my life for the last six years. I feel like I gave birth to this (laughs) object. What is that, an elephant? How long (laughs) is an elephant pregnant? That would be interesting to know. Uh, So what prompted it is and this doesn't really give anything away for anyone who hasn't read the book, but I was in a very bad car accident when I was pregnant with my oldest child, um, my oldest child, Jade. And that was now almost 25 years ago. On September 11th this year, it'll be 25 years since that I read that accident. and I was like, what are the chances? Right. September 9/11. 11th. That's yeah. Crazy. So after that car accident, which was actually, I mean, I almost died. and the baby inside of me would have died if I hadn't made it. But, um, cause she was, I was only 14 weeks pregnant at the time. Mm. And when I recovered, which was a long recovery, ended up giving birth on my due date, you know, everything went normal with the pregnancy. When I recovered and got back, I didn't even think I would be able to walk, let alone run. I was in a wheelchair for weeks. So when I did recover, I made a vow to myself that I was going to write a book about this someday. Now, I had an infant, I had a full-time job, I had a husband, I had things that took me away from that. Almost three years later, I had another child. So the book went on hold for many years, but I always had it in the back of my head that I was going to write it. So I continued teaching in my professional job at the University of Colorado, teaching political science and international affairs for the next... 16, 18 years. And when I decided to retire in the fall of 2015, I was looking to retire in 2016. I thought, okay, this is it. I'm going to retire. I'm going to write my book, talk about how I had this horrible car accident, but I recovered and I'm back to running and doing all the things I did prior to the car accident. Well, 2016 was the year 
that changed my life in so many ways. Um, so when I started writing, a lot of things happened that changed the trajectory of what the book became. And I didn't see it at the time. I mean, it took a while. Again, it's been six years of writing the book, but the evolution and what happened during that time, one, I think I evolved and then went through some pretty horrific things in my personal life and with my family. So in 2016, my mother passed away and we found out that my daughter Jade was addicted to cocaine along with some other drugs. And she was a senior in high school. So that happened in early 2016. Fast forward a little bit to the end of the summer. I was in a very bad trail running accident where I broke my arm in half. I fell, tripped, basically hit a boulder. My arm broke. And I honestly thought I'd never run trails again. But it forced me, once I had to go through this other recovery, to really look deep and figure out what was going on underneath the surface. And I could no longer just write about this miraculous recovery from the car accident. I had to go pretty deep. And over the course of that recovery, which took months, I realized a lot of things about myself, you know, how much I wasn't slowing down to really feel grief and process some of the things that were happening in my life. So the book really helped my healing and my family's healing. And as a result, it took much longer to write than I thought it would initially. That um, there's a couple of things that I want to pull out, but I also want to tell listeners that you are so glad right now we don't do video. And um, I will not share the image of the broken arm because I can't get that out of my head. Yeah. That needs to come with a warning, girlfriend. I mean, seriously, it's like, whoa. whoa. Seriously, that was it. When we talk about a traumatic injury, you know, that was traumatic in so many ways. One, going back a little bit to the car accident, you know, I was 14 weeks pregnant my car kind of wrapped around a tree and had spun around. So the whole right side of the car was in on my body and they found me basically underneath the steering wheel. And I broke almost all the bones on the right side of my body, but not my arms and legs, which is quite amazing, but almost everything else that is critical to movement. So I was in a wheelchair, like I said, for weeks and that recovery was, you know, as traumatic as it gets besides the fact that I had a traumatic brain injury. Let Which, me pause you just for a second sure. too, because because we are not video. We need to tell people about your size and stature okay. because True. they I, all know I talk about bed rest and muscle loss. Mm-hmm. And so Vicky, I mean, you could pack her up and put her <laughs> in your carry-on. Okay, guys? <laughs> I've never been described that way. I love that though. Um, yes, I am about five foot one. I've shrunk an inch since middle school. I was five foot two at one point, but I have lost a little bit of height, but I'm still about five one, a little bit over that and under a hundred pounds. And now at the time I was pregnant, I, I was early in my pregnancy. So I hadn't gained a lot of weight at that point, but, and then tragically I did lose some weight when I was in the hospital, but the baby, she got everything. So she was yeah. as healthy as it gets when you, when she was born, uh, you know, full weight. She, I went the full term of the pregnancy, but yes, I was wrapped underneath that steering wheel. And I think when I, when I broke the arm, you know, that many years later, it brought all those pain memories and all of that recovery back to the forefront. And this time I had no brain injury to save me. I mean, I relived that trail running accident over and over again in my head. And that was really tough to come back from. And I think I had like a form of PTSD around trail running for several years and trail running was my thing. I mean, we didn't go into that that much, maybe in my bio, it it talks about a little bit, but you know, I considered myself a trail runner. And so when I had that fall and I was about 55 at the time, I was 55 years old, right? Yeah. I was about to turn 56. You know, my whole adult life, I've been running on trails, kind of pretty extreme. Uh, Your identity races. is gone. 
I just lost all my confidence. It was like my mojo was just out the window. So that coupled with trying to process who I was, you know, as a person, as an athlete, trying to write this book, telling people how to heal, right? Here I am trying to be the one who's telling people how to heal and I'm broken once again. That really forced a reckoning for me of, you know, stuff happens and why is it happening to me? And I didn't want to, I, I never played the victim in my life, but when you're really hurt, it is hard not to have the pity party and think, why did this happen to me? And, you know, I was, couldn't sleep at night. So I'm up reliving that trail accident and thinking, you know, I can't sleep. I can barely move. Going through all those self doubts of, will I ever be the same again? Will everybody, and that was true when I had the car accident with Jade in my belly. So, what I decided in both cases is just to get on with it. There was a point, you know, a point early in both injuries and the aftermath where maybe I felt sorry for myself a little bit, but I didn't stay there. And I thought, okay, what do I need to do to move on from this and get better? And it was a step-by-step process in each case, but I just moved forward. I just thought, I can't go back. I'm not going to go back to where I was before these accidents. I have to start where I'm at and take a step at a time to get better. And there were times where it was miserable. I mean, especially with the car accident, you know, there was one point in my recovery where I'd broken my sacrum and my pubic bone. So, which early on was not the most the worst part of my injuries. But after a few weeks, that became like the critical point because I was trying to get up and out of my wheelchair to go and do therapy. And just the act of standing was excruciating. I mean, Mm. to the point where I was in tears and dreading any movement up or down because I, my broke, my pubic symphysis was fractured that's, it's a joint, but that's how they talked about it. And when I would get up to move, it was just, and that's our pivot point. That's what we move from. So any movement was just painful. And I would come to dread having to go to the bathroom or get up. That's where my mind was going. How was that? Yeah, it was, it was tough. And then same thing with the arm. It was so brutal coming back from that, especially because, and Deborah's read the book, but for those of you who haven't, I had to have two surgeries to repair that arm. And that was my worst nightmare. One going under the knife. I had never gone under the knife. Um, you know, it wasn't my option. Like I had an emergency uh, appendectomy one time when I was about 29 and I had the C-sections, but those were necessary. This was, the doctors told me I had to have surgery to repair the arm, but at first, I didn't want to believe it. So it felt like it was an optional surgery. I was like, why can't it heal on its own? But everyone convinced me I needed the surgery. And to have to go through that twice was really mm. devastating for me. That was just very challenging. But I think... Go ahead. Okay, can I interrupt? Yeah, sure. I want to ask you a question. So I know you said like you had some kind of epiphany, a kind of a turning point, and you just decided, I'm going to pull myself Mm -hmm. up and out of this and pull on my big girl skirt, so to speak. Yes. What about people around you? I mean, did you experience, you know, that um, continuum of, you know, some people wanting to coddle you and say, oh, you know, you don't have to do that. It's fine. And I'll do that for you versus the, you know, kick in the pants, like, no, do this yourself. I mean, what was the what bothered you the most? What was most helpful to you? How was your environment of other people? That is such an interesting question because what I think about immediately is that my mother, who was a no nonsense kind of person, she and I had our battles. I mean, we, part of the book is really about her, her negative influence on me, which ended up resulting in a positive influence. She she was depressed my whole childhood, but she also was a true independent woman for her time. And she really instilled that independence in her children. 
you know, coupled with being a very controlling person. But for me, I had this dual thing going on when I was a kid where she was teaching me to be independent. And I also was running away from her, you know, like I was trying to be even more independent than she was allowing me to be because she was also controlling. So there was this element of from a very young age, I was taking care of myself. And starting, I think before I was even 10, I was just doing things for myself, partly because she was just not able to. She was dealing with depression. There were things she did as a mother that I think were very loving and caring, and she loved all her children, but she really wasn't capable because of her depression. It just took over in so many ways. So from a very young age, I learned how to take care of myself. So that's one thing. And I took that into my adulthood. I mean, I just remember throughout my growing up years, I was very much responsible for myself. So when it came to healing from injuries, my husband was super supportive. I mean, he never left my side when I was in the hospital from after the car accident. And he had to do a lot for me because at that point, I mean, I was really broken. I couldn't, there was, I couldn't even go to the bathroom by myself. So he was there to help me, but I hated being dependent on anyone. Being dependent on my husband was okay because he was the closest person to me, but I wanted to stop that as soon as I could. So I did not like the feeling of being dependent on anyone. So it started with the littlest things. As soon as I could get out of bed by myself, I did. It wasn't like I thought, well, he's helping me, so he needs to keep helping me. I actually wanted to get over that as quickly as I could. And that was pretty much just my personality. That's just how I am. Uh, And I think it just comes from this independence that was instilled in me at a very young age. There were times I was really resentful because he could do, he wasn't in pain for one thing. So he didn't, and no one was in pain, as much pain as I was coming out of those accidents. So I always felt like they just don't get it. They don't know how much this hurts. But I kind of put on a, I think I to convince myself I could get better, I didn't let myself really, I don't know, wallow in that. It's like, yeah, this hurts. But if I keep going and keep trying to do as much as I can on my own, it's going to get better. So I kept telling myself that I'm going to be able to do these things for myself. Ultimately, I knew I'd get better, but in the moment it was time and there were, it was hard. And there were times when I was resentful. I mean, most of it was when I was awake at night at three in the morning, could not sleep. And my husband is snoring. You know, I can hear him. I usually I would go in another room. I was sleeping out on the couch when I was here and I, I would just get agitated because I'm like, it's not fair. He can sleep and I can't, but I just would make the most of my time. I'd watch shows that I wanted to watch when I ultimately could read after the car accident, you know, I had the, the brain injury lasted for months, so I couldn't even see clearly for several months. I couldn't read, but I could listen to audiobooks at a certain point, whatever I could do that felt productive. I would start doing that as soon as I could to not feel sorry for myself. So while you're talking, I'm wondering, like through that, did you rely on anything? And I, I know this is not politically correct, but are you spiritual? Did you rely Mm -hmm. on that? Or was it more tapping into your inner strength yourself? I would say the way, so I don't want to say that I am not spiritual because I think I've tapped into a spiritual side of myself in the last, I don't know, in my adult life. Like, I mean, I was running away from religion my whole life because my parents, my father especially insisted that I go to Jewish school and my family was fairly Jewish as a, as a religion. That was our religion, but we weren't the Orthodox Jews on the, on the block, but we, you know, did have to go to services and things like that. And I hated it. I hated it from day one. I was rebelling against that pretty much my whole life. So for me, the idea of finding any kind of source of solace in a religion was just never something that worked for me. But I always found my spiritual self out in nature. 
So for me, as soon as I could get outside and walk, that is where I found peace and a feeling of being alive. For me, movement from a very young age was when I felt the most alive. So sitting in synagogue on the weekends was my worst nightmare. I hated it from the time I was four years old and begged my father to let me stop going and he wouldn't. So I was always seeking to get away from that. So when I was in my recoveries, I don't think I was looking to any kind of source of, it wasn't like I prayed or I don't have a God in that way. It was more inside of me. I looked for this internal strength and at times that was tough because there were many moments where I just did not feel strong. I felt broken. I felt my body was betraying me. But I would always come back to this feeling that of inner strength that I've always seemed to tap into when I've needed it. So that, that it was something inside of me which I would call my spiritual being. You know, it's yeah. not something you can touch or yeah. even explain that well, but it was yeah. inside of me and I've always been able to, to get to that. You know, and I, I want to say this and anybody who's experienced this before, who's called themselves a runner, mm-hmm. I think there is some, there is some strong association with running and writing, number mm-hmm. one. But I also think that a lot of us who have been runners and felt that, just ease of, you know, you get out and you go and you hit that cruising altitude. And that is somehow spiritual or yeah. spiritual yeah. without being, you know, religious, you know, yeah. necessarily. But it is when you tap into there's something more here. And this is not just about running, you know, it's about more. Yes. And I think, you know, the reason I titled my book, Running and Returning, that was not the original title, but it came to me through the research that I did in the writing of the book. Uh, Probably in about 2019, I heard of the mystical concept of running and returning that is in Judaism. It's in the mystical side of Judaism. And it so resonated with me, even though my whole life I've been running away from Judaism. I did not want to define myself that way. But here was this strand of Judaism that just captured everything about my life. That when I was young, I was running away from pain and sadness in my own household, but running towards this feeling of joy and feeling alive and finding my spiritual self out in nature. So running has always been this this kind of complex web of finding myself, but running away from hard things as well. And that's kind of what I was exploring in the book, you know, through my accidents, through my daughter's drug addiction, through grieving for my mother's death. I mean, all of those things and my father, um, how easy it was for me when things were hard to go for a run, which on the one hand would make me feel better, but it's always temporary. I mean, running and, and so many things that we seek to comfort ourselves are temporary solutions to usually a deeper problem (laughs) that if we don't face it comes back to haunt us. And that's kind of what kept happening to me. I use running to run away from those painful things without really taking the time at different points in my life. It wasn't always like this. I mean, there were times where it really served me well and has served me well and it continues to, but there were times where I used it. I want to say maybe as a crutch or just as something that would cover up the painful things I did not want to face emotionally, not so, not so much physically, but um, the emotional pain of just being human, right? We just always have these, these pain points that come as a result of being in a human body, having human relationships. You can't avoid it if you are living amongst other humans. (laughs) There's so much I want to ask you, but I first want to go back and peel back. When did you first start running and develop this relationship with it? So I was 
running, I think from the time I could walk in the sense of just running like, you know, in my backyard, running down the street. I didn't, I started distance running, like what we would actually call distance running, like a steady straight running when I was about 14. And the very first time I recall running what any, what I would call any kind of distance, it was a mile basically around our neighborhood running track. And I had gone down to the track with my, one of my older sisters who was home from college and she had gained the, that freshman 15 and she wanted mm-hmm. to go run. <laughs> and she asked me if I wanted to go with her. And I said, sure. I mean, I didn't even know really. I mean, I was very athletic, but I didn't even think about running as a thing that you do. It was just, you run to go get a ball is all I knew. But I said, I'll go with you. So we're running around this track and this guy who I don't know how old he was, but to me, he seemed ancient, but he was probably in his thirties. Um, <laughs> and he came up to me and he said, you would make a good marathon runner. I have never forgotten that. I didn't even know at the time. I mean, I was barely, I might've even been 13. So I didn't even know really much about a marathon or what that was. I knew it was a distance event, but I didn't have much clue other than that. And he, when he said those words to me, it just stayed in my head. And so later, when I really did start running, which was probably f- a couple years later, I decided to, you know running was making me feel really good. I was running before high school. I wasn't running competitively. I just would get up in the mornings before I went to school at 5 a.m. and run a couple of miles around my neighborhood. But his words that I would make a good marathon runner just kind of stuck in my head. Now I had a long way to go because I had many imbalances that people have, you know, if you're not taking care of yourself or you just don't know any better. And I dealt with a lot of injuries in my early years of running, but I still had that idea that, oh, I can be a runner. And his words just, yeah. I would love to go back and find that man and thank him because it definitely influenced me. So that was when I first started. And then I played lacrosse in high school. That was kind of my main competitive sport along with tennis and basketball. Continue to play lacrosse in college. And that was my competitive outlet. And when I graduated college, of course, I no longer had that. I'm a competitive person and I was looking for something to kind of channel that energy and started just picking up a few running races. I moved to Hawaii for a couple of years and there were tons of running races there. So I would just jump in a few, but I never considered myself a competitive runner until I moved to Boulder when I picked up competitive running because of the people I met. And again, met someone who convinced me, I have no idea why, but said, you should think about trying to qualify for the Olympic trials. I thought, what are the Olympic trials was my first question. I had no idea. And at they this won't point, let you actually live in Boulder if you say <laughs> things like that, will they? <laughs> at that time, I think it was still, you know, okay, but I was under the radar. But again, this was 1986. So 1984 was the first women's Olympic marathon anyway. So it really oh. wasn't a thing for very long. But mm-hmm. I didn't even know there was something called the Olympic trials. I found out, I found out the qualifying time was going to run under two hours and 50 minutes. I had run two marathons. The first one was 409. The second one was 350. So I looked at him like he had horns coming out of his head. I'm like, what are you kidding? That is a lot of time. Even I know that taking an hour off your marathon time is just, I don't think you're crazy. But for whatever reason, (laughs) I thought, why not? So I started training. And it took a year and a half, but lo and behold, I ran 249 at the 1987 Twin Cities Marathon. Wow. And then, and again, I don't want to make it, I don't want to downplay that. It was a lot of work. I, I really worked hard at it. I had been running for a while, right? I started running when I was 14. So at this point I was 25, almost 26 when I qualified. So I'd been running for over 10 years, but not with any systematic training. So once I started systematic training, I got faster and faster and then did qualify. And then that started the whole cavalcade of events around running, where once I started running faster, that kind of took over 
And my ego started playing a little role in seeing how much faster I could get. What more could I do with my running? And I will have to, I have to admit, and the book goes into this, how that started to override why I originally started running, which was just to make myself feel good and find that spiritual component that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Did you lose that when you started? To I think I lost faster? it for a little while. I think mm -hmm. I lost it. Um, you know, what happened was, yes, I think I did lose it for a period of time. Then when I, you know, then when I met my husband, he and I were such play partners that, you know, he was a very competitive athlete as well, an endurance athlete. So we kind of did it together and it was a lot of fun. But again, I was very driven by winning. And then, of course, the car accident put a stop to all of that because I lost my ability to move for a while. So for a short period of time, when I was recovering, I let go of all that. I thought, if I ever get to run again, it'll be a miracle. And I'm just going to do it because I love it. But pretty soon, my competitive self reared its head. And once I did recover and I started getting faster again and stronger, again, winning and doing well in races kind of started coming back in as my motivation. And I've always had to kind of balance that. I think once I became more of a competitive runner, it's a constant battle for me, even now, because I'm now competitive as a master's runner, you know, in local races, I'm not talking about being competitive nationally, but I do well. And I still have to remind myself, I'm doing this because I love it, because it makes me feel good. And it doesn't matter how fast I run. And this is especially, it's been really helpful for me in the last couple of years, because I'm running better than ever. But I think my attitude around it is so much healthier. I'm doing it for the love, right reasons. Love that. Okay. So let's dive back into, you mentioned, so your, your year two, 2016, you're 55, mm -hmm. you have the break in the arm, mm -hmm. and then you've got this trauma around trail running. Mm -hmm. And that was part of your identity. How did that because I have to spoiler alert to listeners. So I'll tell you what we talked about in the green room just before we got started, but she's trail running again. How did that first trail run after your arm injury go? So very tentative. And the way I started, it was just walking. And I walked, you know, first I started walking on pavement. Alone? Then, or did at you take first somebody? I started walking alone, but yeah. then I also had I was very fortunate because a good friend of mine who qualified for his name's Benji Durden and he had qualified for the Olympics actually in 1980. He was one of the best US marathoners and he was going through cancer rehabilitation. He was having chemo and coming back from that he was doing he was walking basically. And somehow we connected. I mean we were good friends and he actually had coached me years before. And we had just always stayed friendly. So he invited me to go walking with him and he's going through chemotherapy. I have this arm that is just a mess. So we just started walking and first both of us on pavement because he was still very tentative as well and kind of shaky from his recovery. But I would walk with him every week, a few times a week and gradually it happened fairly quickly, but the first few weeks we were just walking and then he started adding in a few moments of jogging. So he would walk for three minutes and jog for a minute. And the first time I went with him and he was doing that, I thought my doctors had already said to me, oh no, you're not going to do that yet. And this was probably maybe two to three weeks after the surgery. So, I mean, I have multiple hard pieces of hardware in this arm, so it's held together but my doctor was being very cautious with me and he did not want me to do too much. But Benji's running. So I'm like, I'm going to start running. So the first, very first step I took where both feet were off the ground was to me miraculous. I couldn't believe I could do it without any pain, without the arm feeling like it was going to come apart. So it took baby steps. 
you know, it was from walking by myself to starting to walk with Benji, then, you know, jogging for a minute. And when I say jogging, I mean, really, we were going slow. But gradually, he and I just built up what we were doing, the point we were out running steadily. But again, when I say trails, we were on what I would call a gravel path. There were very few obstacles, and it still felt scary to me. So I graduated from that to a little bit, you know, more difficult single track trails, but over the course of months. And I want to say it probably took almost two years of just gradually increasing the difficulty of trail to the point where I felt even remotely confident. And then I added poles at a certain point. I decided to use trekking poles. And at first it was very awkward because I had never used poles when I was running. I mean, that was like for mountain runners in the U.S., that's always been like forbidden. And now in Europe, I mean, they all they all use poles. And now it's become more more common here. But when I first started using them, I felt like I was, you know, totally using crutches. It just didn't feel right. But I knew I needed something to feel stable and I wanted to run on the trail. So brought that into it. Now I have these very lightweight running poles that I use pretty much all the time when I'm on trails. And I love them because I feel like I can use, I can be on any terrain now and have no fear. Nice. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to take a little diversion. So you ended at this. um, And of course, I know it's in the book, but other than you dropping it, so that you're, uh, let's just say this, 2016 was a bitch for you. Um, It definitely, we had some family things going on there too. So I don't know if the stars were aligned wrong or what happened, but um, many major life events for you that year. And one of them was your daughter's struggle with addiction. How, you know, talk a little bit about the discovery of that, first of all, and, and how has that played out in your reliance on or enjoyment of running? So what happened, just stepping back a little bit, my parenting philosophy was very much influenced by my mother's philosophy, which was pretty much let your teenagers do what they're going to do unless they're going to, you know, jump off a roof. Like you don't, you just let them go. And so my mother- While they're under your roof, yeah. (laughs) She was kind of like hands off, but you know, there were certain rules and parameters. And she was ahead of her time. She was definitely ahead of her time. There's no question about it. And I think if she had just been able to figure out her own- emotional self. I mean, she would be the model parent, but she had other stuff that got in the way of that. So I always thought, well, I was a fairly rebellious teenager. You know, I experimented with drugs. If my kids are experimenting, it's okay because, you know, they're going to experiment, but they're always going to come back because my husband and I have been very open with them. He is a recovering alcoholic. He's been sober since he was 18. We were always open with them about that, warning both our daughters that they you know, could have a, a tendency towards addiction. So just be careful. And we were open with them from a very young age. So I thought, because we talked to them, it was never going to be a problem. So in high school, we started, I started noticing that she was struggling in school. And if, there were other signs that something was going on, but she always seemed to kind of come back. Because one, both our kids are very athletic. So they were always on one sport team or another. So she was performing well in her sports. Even though we would see signs in school she wasn't doing well, her friends, you know, were a little bit questionable. Her mood when she was really, when she turned 15, I thought, who is this child and where did my daughter go? (laughs) Because I did not recognize her at all. But I, again, thought it was the moody teenage blues and, you know, she's just being a little bit defiant because she's a strong personality and all that. So we saw little glimpses of it, but really what happened her senior year started in the fall, her behavior started getting worse and worse and just moodier, unpleasant to be around. My response was, I just didn't want to be around her. So she started spending more and more time at her boyfriend's house. 
I thought this is great because she's unpleasant. Let her be there. But then we'd have these moments of family time. I mean, either game nights or holidays where she seemed to somewhat come back to us. So it was always, I was always getting these mixed messages. Well, then we had a very disturbing event that happened in the fall of 2015, where she really overdid some drug use combined with some alcohol. And it was a scary night. And I won't go into the details because I describe it in pretty vividly in the book, but it was a really scary point for the family. And that was kind of a wake up call that something was wrong, but we were getting ready to go to, on a family trip to Mexico. And in the midst of all this, it seemed like that was all we need. We just needed to get away. She was sad about a breakup with a boyfriend you know, her friend, we needed to get her away from her friends and just a change of environment would be enough. We got back from that trip. I actually had convinced myself that things were okay, even though they really weren't. And we got a call from the headmaster at her school. I want to say it was within the first couple of days of school starting. It might've even been the first day. I'm not quite sure about that, but we were called in and they told us that things were really bad and Jade admitted to it and also asked for help. And so at that point, we got her into a mental hospital and we took the recovery from there. But it was, there were little signs along the way, but I was able to convince myself that she was going to be okay. As long as we were that loving family, giving her support, she couldn't be an addict. In my mind, she just couldn't be an addict. I didn't believe it. I didn't think that's who she was. And I still, and I mentioned this in the book, I still have questions about what addiction really means because I do believe there's a continuum. And I think every person has a different point along that scale where it turned into addiction. And each person needs to kind of figure out where that is. And even myself with running, running, yeah. I admit to being a running addict. Now, people will argue, well, running isn't the same as substances. You know, the only person I'm really hurting is myself, but it's not really true. The running addict can hurt people around them when they lose sight of what's important, when they will run to the point where they hurt themselves because that ends up hurting the people around them. Uh, I think it has parallels. And I think. I've learned to find the balance in how much running, running means a lot to me and it makes me feel good But when it goes past the point of being healthy. I think I've found that point. Now, I don't think with substances, if someone is an addict, it's probably not good for them to use substances, but we all have some things, something we find to, I want to say, find our set point, like our equilibrium. And it can be a substance. It can be, they call running and things like that process addictions. So something you do to make yourself feel good. Most of those things have an end point. Like you can't run 24 seven. If you take cocaine 24 seven over many months, you are going to fall apart right? So all of these addictions have a point where they no longer do what they did initially. They stop making you feel good. So I think finding that for each individual is, is an individual thing. So for me, coming back from Jay's addiction, when, when she, we were going through the process of rehabbing her, which we did, to be honest, we did that at home, because she was at the age where she was aging out of youth programs and too young for adult programs. So we brought her home and she resolved to get better. It was her decision to figure out how to get sober, how to re-enter into her life with our support. But during that process, running really was helpful for me because it gave me a sense of peace and that just bit of alone time that I needed in order to be there for her. Very cool. Yeah. 
I would, I mean, I can just so relate that it's grounding for you. You were yes. able to return to routine when everything had been like shaken up. Yes. No, no routine. It was all different. Yes. And even when she was going through her teenage, like the worst of it, and I was really not liking her very much. And, and she knows this. I mean, she was tough to be around. Running was always where I could escape and at least feel good for a few moments before coming back to the house and having to deal with what was going on in our family. I mean, there were just a few years that were just really challenging. And running was always the thing that made me, that I could go to to make me feel okay. It was my thing and my thing alone. And I needed that. Again, it, you could say it was my church. I mean, it was how I, it was where I went to pray, even though I didn't think about it like that. It wasn't praying. I was just finding that meditative space in my life that allowed me to deal with all the turmoil that was going on in the rest of my life. Love that. I, um, okay. So as you were, I'm putting together the dots and I think we need to tell this story before I ask my next question. So, I, I mean, every parent who's listening is saying, what's the end of the story? Where's Jade now? Okay. So it is my pleasure to say that she mm. is probably one of my best friends. She has mm. become this, I mean, she was I have always, chills. I have goosebumps right Well, now. she was always a beautiful human. Like I remember when she came out of me and I thought this, it was almost like she was glowing. She had so much light around her and she was like that as a child. I mean, she was a happy kid. You know, things started to change when she, I think, pre-adolescence is where things started to change and then got dark when she was <clears throat> in her teenage years. But she's come back to that true light of who she is now. And she is living a very healthy life. She's active as anything. She finds a lot of joy in being outside. She runs with me. She's not, she's smart. She's not like a super <laughs> extreme runner because she loves to run, but she's not doing things like I do, like a 50 mile race in a month. She's more balanced than that, but she loves to surf. She loves to, she bikes. She's now playing roller derby on a team. Um, she just incredibly has an incredible variety of activities she loves to do. She has her own business, which is thriving. She's doing website design and social media marketing, as well as photography. She's a fantastic photographer. She does all of my social media, which I don't know what I would do without her because I'm hopeless. And so she does everything in that regards for me. She <laughs> designed my website, which again is something I never could have done. I don't even know how she does it. Pretty much self-taught. I mean, she's done some trainings, but she's pretty much self-taught in everything she does. She's trained with a, photog a professional photographer, which again, her skill is beyond measure. She's a really good photographer. Uh, yeah. So it, it's, it's a happy ending. She's doing fantastic, really well. Love it. Love, love, love. And I know I've seen a couple of photos of the two of you running yeah. together and love that. Do you ever, I mean, you were 25 years ago, 14 weeks pregnant yes. with her in a horrific car accident. And I mean, my mind, because I do know the end of the story of where we are today, says she was a fighter from the beginning. Oh. No surprise, right? The resilience, her resilience boggles my mind. But I also know from doing research that this is true of all humans, but when kids go through traumatic events, adverse childhood experiences, and they have many of them, one of two things can happen. One, they can really fall apart. And, and that is definitely the sad story for many. But also they can develop this resilience of dealing with difficult life experiences that carries them through. And I do believe that defines her. I just think she's been, she's demonstrated that her whole life. And yes, you know, we will fall down the rabbit hole occasionally. Everyone's going to have things that take us out, but how we come back from it, I think is what defines us because there's bad things are going to happen. That's just life. 
but then what you choose to do afterwards. And she, I saw that when she was turning 18 and deciding what she was going to do in this moment. And when she turned to me and said, I want to come back to school. I want to graduate with my class. I want to be play on the golf team. I want to do all these things. As I looked at her again, my husband and I both, let's just get you healthy. You don't, you know, you don't have to do all that. You can take your time coming back. No, I want to get better and I want to do all of this. And she did. So yeah, true resilience. Very cool. Very cool. Well, she's had a great role model. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. And it's such a pleasure. So I'm going to ask you the hardest perhaps question of the day. Okay. Framing it with all of our listeners are, you know, for the most part. So if you're an outlier listener, I'm not ignoring you. Stay where you are. I'm so glad you're here. But our women between 45 and 70, mm -hmm. and sometimes we get here and we are, we're not in a wheelchair following an accident. We didn't have that rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And I, I say it that way because I think sometimes that's an advantage to get to the bottom, mm -hmm. to have to have the wake up call. And instead, you know, we're in the middle of this crazy life with older parents and aging parents and younger um, adult, young adult kids still relying on us and, mm. and the middle of a pandemic, you can just throw that in there and hormones raging. And, you know, it sometimes feel like, it feels like it is too late. It's um, like I, you know, don't do that or I won't do that because I've never been that. And mm -hmm. we think of ourselves in a certain way that maybe is like within within a box of this parameter that we're, I've always thought about myself this way. What question should I have asked you or what would you say to women like that? And we're saying that knowing that a very select few of you may actually attend our September retreat and you are going to meet Vicki in person. She can tell a few more little details about her story. And then she's also going to lead us in a running clinic. And by the way, when I go to Boulder and I need a running coach, it's Vicki that I call. So, um, but for everybody here, what would you say? Well, a few things come to mind. And one of the things that I think is most important for, for everyone, I mean, every human being, but as women in particular, I think we need to know that we are enough as we are, that we, we really are, we have so much to offer other people just by being women because of our innate resilience and also ability to nurture. But what we usually do is we send that away and we don't use it on ourselves. And I think we need to nurture ourselves. We need to love ourselves first so that we can love the people around us. Coupled with that, I think a curiosity about what our capabilities are, like what can we do that maybe we haven't tried before and just treating it as not trying to achieve anything, but just checking things out. Like, well, maybe I've never run before, but what would it feel like to run? And it could be anything. I mean, maybe it's not running. Maybe it's you want to try rock climbing or you have some, some pent up desire to go someplace you've never gone before or experiencing, experience something new. And I think giving yourself the permission to do that it's just so life affirming. And so I think those things, nurturing yourself and also being curious about what is still possible, because I really don't think there's an age limit to trying anything. There are certain things that I don't particularly want to do. Like I don't really want to jump out of an airplane. That's just not something that's on my bucket list. You might lose more height, so I'm not going to let you do that. Yeah, I don't really want to do that. But <laughs> climbing another mountain for me, like finding a new place to explore, that motivates me. So tapping into that, like what it doesn't have to be what motivates anyone else, but it's what motivates you, what is going to pull out that joy in you, that feeling of being alive and kind of going 
into that deep part of yourself that maybe you haven't let yourself go to because you've been focused on all the people around you. That's what I would say. Love that. Yeah, I'm I was letting that pregnant pause sit there because I think it was that was such a rich answer. Oh, thank, thank you so much. Absolutely. Okay, last question, and this one's easy. Where's the best place for, well, it's in Boulder at the retreat, but second best place for mm-hmm. listeners to all find you? So I would say my website, which is vforcepro.com, is has all the links to my contact, my book, where you can buy it, um, my Instagram, all those things are on my website. So it's probably the easiest place to go to. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. So that, by the way, the link will be in the show notes. As show notes will be, by the way, at flipping50.com forward slash running. And I will put, I'm actually going to put a couple links to a couple related, unrelated. So they were both about males. Um, but kind of from history of running and history of running and track um, that I think you might also find inspiring if at least running is a part of this conversation that struck you. So I will put a link to Vicki's book, to her website, and to some other uh, books, but also to her previous episode with me. That'll be in the show notes at flipping50.com forward slash running and I love to hear from you. So leave a comment, leave a question for Vicki or for I, if you've got one. And what are you waiting for? Let's start Flipping 50 today. 